1984, a very young new chief executive officer of the Environmental Defense Fund came to visit me in my office at the Conservation Foundation, which I then headed. He was uh, even younger than I was, and I had been pretty young for, I think, 33 when I took office there. Environmental Defense Fund had enjoyed a, has enjoyed is probably the wrong word, experienced a period of leadership instability prior to his arrival, and it was a um, significant and a somewhat daring choice to select someone who had run a nonprofit organization in Connecticut at his age to revitalize, rebuild, and it had to be rebuilt, the Environmental Defense Fund. He mostly asked me about a program we had at the Conservation Foundation entitled Business in the Environment, the premise of which was that the American people, by all of the polling that we saw, were deeply supportive, even through the recessions, the Arab oil embargo, of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, and if anything, wanted them strengthened. And um, we had made the case in our business environment project that corporations which had largely opposed, not collaborated at all in the design of those very important statutes with enormous economic implications, needed to get on board, needed to recognize the culture had moved on, these statutes were here to stay, and to the extent there were problems with them and there were significant implementation issues, they should engage. That is a message that, uh, that Fred had already come to believe, and it was clear from our conversation that he was going to take EDF in a somewhat daring new direction, and the clamshell of McDonald's was where he first established the principle of uh, absolutely public and aggressive collaboration on behalf of the environment and conservation and recycling with a major U.S. and somewhat controversial organization. There was criticism of that. There was a great deal of surprise within certain environmental circles, and um, it bothered him as nearly as I could tell, not at all. <laughs> he went on to uh, distinguish himself and his organization in some most resourceful and effective ways. And one of the most notable ones that directly, that I was directly involved in, was in the reauthorization of the Clean Air Act, where we proposed a cap and trade program for sulfur dioxide, a market-based regulatory approach. And that had a great deal to do, its origins, with the Environmental Defense Fund, which had worked on it, on a project with Senator Heinz um, and Senator Kerry? Who was the other senator? Um, yeah. Worth. 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 Um, I've forgotten what the name of it was, but it, it, was, um, it presaged the initiative and the title in the Clean Air Act. And as EPA administrator, I still recall in the meetings that I had with environmentalists about the bill, but then pending or proposed legislation. When it came time for the Environmental Defense Fund to use their five minutes in the meeting, most of the other organizations had their eyes on the floor. There was no real understanding and certainly no sympathy for a market-based approach, which was seen by the environmental left, most of environmental mainstream, group mainstream, as a, as a permit to pollute. And it didn't help for me to say, well, that's what we do at EPA, is make permits which are permits to pollute, subject to declining ceilings and significantly declining ones in the case of acid rain. Well, this initiative was hugely successful, much more successful cost-wise cost than even its advocates, including myself and EPA, had expected. It was uh, very effective. and. Um, and, and it made history, and it became the basis for the Kyoto Protocol's own approach in 1998. Well, Fred, having started as the youngest guy on the block, is now, I think, the senior NGO leader in the environmental community in the United States. And as such, he has enormous stature and recognition and respect. And. Uh, I warned him this morning, and we agreed that I would nevertheless uh, follow through. 
by saying that it is not consistent with his role and history and the profound effect that he can have, particularly on the environmental community, to take a pass on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He uh, will explain his reasons, I suppose. Maybe he won't. <laughs> but, but the environmental provisions that affect those uh, 14, 17 countries, 17 countries, I think, many of which do not have a high priority for the environment, are very significant with respect to forestry, fisheries, endangered species. The kinds of commitments that the countries have been willing to make in the context of this trade agreement, they would not make for any other reason than for the trade deal. And I think that uh, the community is divided. The NRDC and the Sierra Club are both uh, against uh, what World Wildlife Fund is for, and uh, Oceana is. Um, but this is an issue of the sort that uh, someone like Fred, I think, needs to speak to. And uh, so I have uh, made a friendly gesture and now encourage you to do the same. <laughs> uh, I should mention one other thing that uh, Fred and I collaborated. We've, we've collaborated on so much. He was the Riley uh, Fellow um, Award winner at American University last year, which made me immensely proud. I could not think of anyone more deserving who uh, had a better claim to the kind of leadership that we hope to foster in that program than Fred Krupp. We worked together on the largest private equity deal in history some, well now, 10 years ago. And um, we're very proud to be part of a deal that resulted in canceling eight new coal-fired power plants in Texas and three in other deregulated states where TXU, Texas Utilities, now Energy Future Holdings, uh, had interest. He is a very uh, emblematic representative of positive, optimistic, progressive conservationist who has a record of achievement really that uh, I don't think is equaled by any other environmental leader. And it gives me tremendous pleasure, great deal of personal satisfaction to uh, introduce to you Fred Krupp. Thank you, Bill. Um, so leadership. Small question, what, what will it take to protect humanity? That's all I want to talk about this morning. <laughs> and um, I guess I want to describe to you my perspective on what effective leadership is in the context of today, effective leadership that can succeed against the daunting environmental challenges that truly face humanity. And I want to describe what that looks like at three levels, both the level of the individual, the level of the corporation, and the level of government. I also want to spend a minute, though, talking about the context of, of rapid change in the United States on the meaning of the word environmental and organizations, too. So let's start with that context. One of the things that's fast changing about America is that we are becoming more diverse much more quickly than the major environmental organizations, I am sorry to say. Green groups still overrepresent white people and white hair. Yes, I, I stand <laughs> in front of you as testimony to that. Um, I am absolutely convinced that in order to lead, we need to do a better job engaging younger and more diverse constituencies. And our ranks, I think, have been strengthened by Rhea Su, who has come on to lead the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC, and by the Latino outreach programs that are now being undertaken by the League of Conservation Voters, by Earth Justice, and, and by others. The Environmental Defense Fund, as part of our strategic planning process, We've set ambitious goals for ourselves for continuing improvement 
on the metrics of diversity on our staff, on our board, and our membership, on our partners, and in our work. But we have far, far more to do. Context, environmental. Environmental has become too limiting a work, too limiting a word for the work that we do. It surprises me because I can remember when a scientist told me environmental, um, environmental isn't a piece on the chessboard, it is the board on which the whole game is played. And yet it, it has become a limiting word and especially in a time when attention has become so fragmented, those who want to lead in the environmental field need to find ways to find common cause with health groups, with parent groups, with businesses, with unions, with farmers, with fishermen, and with many others. Because that's the only way we can command enough influence and attention to make the big changes that are necessary. Organizations. Organizations in 2015, organizations like mine, face some truly existential questions. This is an era of, of social media and what some of the internet pundits have called disintermediation, the removal of the middleman organizations. And crowdfunding makes it possible now for folks to, um, donors, just to bypass organizations. Millennials, who may be the most environmental generation in the history, don't necessarily identify either as environmentalists or with organizations. They want to find their own way. So that's another contextual piece, I might say that on that one, the Environmental Defense Fund has created an initiative called Defend Our Future, where millennials define for themselves env what environmental leadership means on their terms and seek to persuade politicians to be serious about climate action. All right, leadership. First at the individual le level, what does it look like? Well, I don't need to look further than this room to find some great examples of leadership. And I'd like to salute you, Tim Profeta, for your 10 years of leadership here at the Nicholas Institute. I met Tim when he was working in the Senate as a policy staffer for Joe Lieberman. And he showed not only the intellectual leadership, but the bipartisanship that was needed to reach across the aisle and craft the very first cap-and-trade legislation for carbon. In recent years, EDF has been proud to work with the Nicholas Institute on carbon and also on fisheries. Also in the room with us today is EDF's new executive director, Diane Regas. Before joining EDF a decade ago, Diane spent nearly 20 years at EPA part of the time working with you, Bill, as director of the Office of Wetlands, Oceans, and Watersheds. She then headed our own oceans program and later became senior vice president overseeing all of our program work. As executive director, Diane has brought her vision and leadership to developing our programs, to our strategic planning, and making all of EDF more effective at getting results. She's been central, for example, to our new alliance with the Nature Conservancy to accelerate the transition of the United States to clean energy and to rebuild that political center so essential to moving forward on the climate issue. Thank you, Diane. And another individual that I've admired for years, of course, is you, Bill Riley. And as you have recited, we did work together in 1990 on the Clean Air Act and the cap and trade program for acid rain. And again, as you mentioned, when you were in your capacity with the Texas Pacific Group, 2007, we helped convince um, TXU to cancel plans for 
eight uh, coal-fired power plants. And then again, um, just five years ago, when you co-chaired the BP Oil Commission, and you included among the, your recommendations a recommendation to Congress to dedicate the bulk of the penalties from BP to restore the Gulf of Mexico ecosystems, which now is, has started to happen. You know, it's a funny thing, but it occurs to me, and it should occur to you, when you see the same person so effectively leading in so many different contexts, that tells you something. Bill is somebody who is not about going it alone. He brings others along. It reminds me of the Harvard professor, Ronald Heifetz, who wrote in a book, Leadership Without Easy Answers, that effective leaders often engage the major stakeholders in deciding how to face a challenge. I've seen that style also in the individual leadership of Mike Bloomberg in different roles as a mayor, as a businessman, as a philanthropist. Beyond philanthropy's partnership with the Sierra Club, Bloomberg Philanthropy's partnership with the Sierra Club on Beyond Coal is a striking example. And as mayor, um, Mike Bloomberg sprang into action when EDF brought to his attention that just 1% of the buildings in New York were spewing out more pollution than all the cars and trucks that traveled through the city. And he created the Clean Heat Program, which helped thousands of buildings convert to cleaner oil and natural gas. And thanks to that, New Yorkers are breathing the cleanest air that we have in 50 years. Individual leadership, I've also had the opportunity to get to know Ben Jealous, the former head of the NAACP, who we're lucky at EDF to have him on our board. Ben reminds me a little bit of a college professor I had named Charlie Walker, a tall, soft-spoken Texan who once told me that people could solve a lot more problems if they just lowered their voices. Effective leaders don't shout down people who disagree with them. They bring people around. The second level of environmental leadership I want to talk about is at the corporate level. EDF did become involved uh, with McDonald's a quarter century ago when we suggested to them that we form a joint waste reduction task force. That was when your Big Mac was served in a bright yellow foam container, which involved a lot more wasteful packaging than it, than it needed to. We set some ground rules at the time for how EDF would engage with companies that we followed ever since. We would accept no money from McDonald's or any of our later corporate partners, and we would make our recommendations public whether or not the company accepted those recommendations. To its credit, McDonald's did adopt dozens of the task force recommendations and substantially reduced its solid waste. In recent years, McDonald's has been a leader in other ways too, directing that the soybeans they buy are not produced from rainforest land and that the chickens that they buy aren't fed with antibiotics that are important for human health. Today, EDF has no more influential a corporate partner than Walmart. A decade ago, we opened up an office in Bentonville and put EDF staff right around the corner from Walmart's home office. After consulting with us and many other advisors, Walmart announced a goal to eliminate 20 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions from its global supply chain by the end of this year. That, by the way, is uh, the equivalent amount of pollution is taking over 4 million cars off the road for a year. Part of the commitment would be met in a novel way asking Walmart's food suppliers to adopt fertilizer efficiency programs. That's because fertilizer not absorbed in the crops can form nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas 300 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. 
And just as with McDonald's, Walmart's actions are having a big ripple effect. The first 15 major Walmart suppliers um, included in the fertilizer efficiency efforts include Campbell's Soup, Smithfield, General Mills, together representing 30 percent of, nor of all North America food and beverage sales. General Mills has done something particularly praiseworthy. Unlike some corporations that reduce their own carbon emissions while continuing to direct their lobbyists to oppose climate legislation, General Mills CEO Ken Powell called on government leaders to act. We cannot get there on our own, Powell said in August. We believe every company, government, and individual has a role to play. Climate change, he said, is a shared global challenge that is best addressed at scale. Yes, in 2015, the bar for what it means to be a corporate leader in the United States is to actively support and work for the climate legislation we need. That brings us to the third level of environmental leadership I wanted to talk about, the governmental level. China's announcement last month that it will launch a national emissions trading system for carbon by 2017 was a huge breath of fresh air. The country plans to sharply reduce its dependence on coal and nearly double its use of clean energy. And from Capitol Hill comes the hopeful news about the safety of chemicals we're exposed to in the products we buy. The nearly 40-year-old Toxic Substances Control Act, which has been so weak that EPA has never been able to have the tools to regulate asbestos, even. Um, and yet, two weeks ago, I stood outside the Capitol building with some of the most conservative and some of the most liberal senators, David Vitter and Jim Inhofe, Ed Markey and Sheldon Whitehouse, who are among now 60 Senate co-sponsors of strong bipartisan legislation to reform this obsolete law. Leadership? Tom Udall has been a driving force and a leader on this bill, which is named after the late Senator Frank Lautenberg. When the measure arrives on the President's desk, it will be the first major piece of federal environmental legislation enacted in more than 20 years. A year ago, not many people would have been counting on environmental leadership to arise from either China or the United States Senate, and now it has. So there is hope. There's also hope on the important climate issue of methane pollution from the oil and gas industry, thanks to a confluence of individual, corporate, and government leadership. Until recently, too little attention has been paid to methane, even though it's responsible for a quarter of the global warming that we experience today. Five years ago, EDF chief scientist Steve Hamburg came to me and EDF's executive team explaining the critical lack of data on methane emissions. To close the gap, Steve organized a massive collaboration with more than 100 academic institutions, think tanks, and energy companies to conduct a series of 16 peer-reviewed research projects measuring methane emissions along with the entire natural gas supply chain. Leadership, bringing people together. Governor John Hickenlooper asked EDF's team to sit down with him on this issue, along with oil and gas companies and other groups to help craft a statewide solution for Colorado. Three of Colorado's biggest producers, Anadarko and Canna and Noble, answered the governor's call. They participated not only in the research, but also in coming on working with us to craft a state solution that would require cuts in methane emissions from their industry. Like General Mills, these companies called for the government to take action. The resulting rules slashed methane emissions by more than 30 percent, 
and cut air pollution as much as getting all the cars and all the trucks off the road in Colorado. Governor Hickenlooper thanked EDF for being fact-based and willing to build alliances. I'd say exactly the same about him. And this August, EPA proposed national standards to cut methane emissions. They don't yet go as far as the Colorado rules, but it's a start. And it's remarkable, perhaps unprecedented, for an environmental issue to go from not even being on the radar to being addressed by new nationwide standards in the space of just a few years. It shows, indeed, we do live in a time of rapid change. And it shows the power of leadership at the individual, corporate, and government levels. There's one last level that I'd like to mention, and that's the spiritual. Along with the rest of New York and Washington, I sat transfixed by the papal visit last month. Pope Francis called on Congress for courageous actions and strategies to meet human needs and protect nature. By standing up for vulnerable people around the world who will suffer the most from climate-related drought, storms, and disease, the Pope provides power, powerful leadership that calls us to our best selves. His environmental encyclical, Laudate Si, is a badly needed moral declaration. Now, some commentators have noted the encyclical also expresses a mistrust for market-based climate solutions, the very kind that EDF and the Nicholas Institute have, are known for and that China has just adopted. But that overlooks the common ground the Pope shares with many proponents of market-based policies, the belief that social values must help set the rules by which our markets operate. EDF has often emphasized that markets cannot establish environmental goals, but once those goals are set, markets can help achieve them efficiently. I was reminded of that point when I heard the Pope's philosophy on markets summarized this way, the common good sets the principles and the market should be organized to support those principles. It's a pretty good definition of EDF's approach. Not unfettered markets, but policies that address market failures. That's why we want to attach a market cost to climate pollution. That's why we want to clear the thicket of regulations to open markets to clean energy entrepreneurs and get the incentives right so that markets reward farmers and fishermen who become stewards of the land and the water. It's why our economist Dan Dudek and the whole China team at EDF have worked so hard to implement China's seven carbon trading pilots, pilots which led to the historic announcement by China's President Xi of a national emissions trading program to be started by 2017. You know, Pope Francis does speak softly, but his statements resonate like thunder. And what he says about the environment has made me realize that all of us in this room, all of us defending creation and humankind, truly are in pursuit of a higher calling, the common good. Yet to fulfill that higher calling, we still need mortal tools, science, economics, markets, and policy. And those things do not lead themselves. That's going to be our job. And we better do that well for the sake of the world. Thank you.